Hi, Mark. What I would like to know is, um, what was your first contact with computer? What was your first computer? What was your first Hello World? So how you got to programming? <laughs> oh, gosh, that started in the very early 80s. I have a big brother. And one of the, the big benefits of having a big brother is that um, he had more money and so on access to computers. And I think it started with a spec, uh, ZX81, uh, which we had briefly. I think he borrowed it. And then later on, uh, Commodore C64. And, uh, you know, the, the cassette players and this tape um, sharing back then. So people have been interested in gaming mostly. And I started tinkering with BASIC. And later on, I there have been magazines where they list text codes. So you can type in your so programs were distributed on paper, basically, back then. So you had to type in rows, tons of rows of hex code into your computer, and then you could save it to your tape. Um, and those listings haven't always been correct, so I started tinkering with them um, and got into assembler programming a little bit, um, also because of neighbors who studied computer science back then, uh, the, the bigger brothers of my school friend. And that helped a lot. So it was a lot of accidental um, contact with, with computer nerds from the early days, which got me into programming very early on. So interesting. The Z81 uh, was the computer with the rubber keys, right? Yes. Yeah. And and uh, incredibly low amount of memory, I think. 8K, I, I don't remember. I think 8K or something. or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I also had that ZX Spectrum, but it was uh, a little bit later, I think. It was the Spectrum the, was later, I think, yeah. No, my, uh, mine was later than yours. So I had already the proper one with, you know, the uh, plastic keys, and it was mm -hmm. from Amstrad. So it already oh. had one, 128 <laughs> kilobytes with a cassette integrated. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it looked uh, really nice. And when, uh, which year was it as you, as you started roughly? Oh, this, this was 80. 182 something like that okay so interesting so and, and the, the next thing which really interests me because uh, i struggled with it how was the transition from basic to assembly i mean how you get the knowledge so someone help uh, you mm -hmm. from colleagues uh, from from these older brothers uh, of my school friend um one of them is uh, currently working for google DeepMind. he's a neuroscience oh. <laughs> and the other is professor in santa monica so they are really um, you know, I've been growing up on the countryside and uh, never felt home there. But those those two persons uh, had kind of shared the same mind. Okay. Um, the problem with me was back then, uh, I didn't have, you know, older brothers or uh, friends. And uh, so I, I struggled with, or not struggle, I understood somehow basic. And then I found out, you know, the pick and pokes. Mm -hmm. And there was no way to understand what actually happens. There were just basically, I remember two numbers. The first one was, I think, the address. And the next one was the value from 0 to 255. And I tried to find out, you know, what it actually means. Because uh, similar to you, there were the magazines where you can, you know, uh, you got, you know, the source code from BASIC and uh, how to call it, uh, cheats for games. So if you know, mm -hmm. typed in, Peak or peak, I think with specific number you get you got endless life or something like this, and and I thought you know how to get the number, so how to do it, how it is possible to know that. So I really struggled with that, and um, and and I think uh, several year, years later I actually understood what happens behind the scenes. Yes, I I'm sure I didn't fully understand. I definitely not understand what I'm really doing. But uh, I remember we had the the tables from the instruction tables from the 6800 motorola processor and the uh the uh, 6510 mm -hmm. um was just a clone of it so it was not fully compatible but a lot of the, the instructions did work mm -hmm. and so it was kind of accidentally <laughs> so, so you said you uh, you grew up on the countryside and you had brothers but um what's all What's what's also interesting for me is why it was inspiring for you to hack some hex code. I, I mean, nowadays you could argue, no, we saw Matrix or a, a kind of movie and it was cool. 
why it was cool back then to do something with the computers or why you were inspired by the computers? It was completely useless, basically. So because uh, you you didn't have the scope of um, writing a business program or so. Those computers, the things we did back then was just playing around. And we I've been happy if I saw a... Um, uh, and, and, images too much a, a character on the screen at some position and that's it yeah. so this was kind of satisfying enough that uh, we started digging further but why you touch the computer at all i mean you know we have a cooking machine or whatever and i'm not interested at all yeah. so but uh, why why you were interested in computers <sighs> that's a hard question of course i think the games mm -hmm. they, Seeing those games and what you could achieve, this was really interesting. So there must be a way to do this with this box. Mm -hmm. So it was proven as the as the games did run, but uh, of course we had no idea and knowledge how to achieve it back then. But trying something out and then seeing a result, whether it be uh, a character on the screen or just having the tape recorder spin, um, this was kind of satisfying enough, and it took kind of hours to get there yeah and i remember sometimes 20 to 40 minutes to load a game and if there was a no one problem with the tape you had to do it again yeah the turbo load <laughs> was the solution back yeah then. Uh, what i remember what do you remember me there was yeah. like there were a copy uh copy software where you can load a game into the software and then uh and then write it again to another tape and yeah. what I did with that, I forgot the names actually, was uh, you know to refresh the tapes so you could load. Copy. Yeah, something like that. And uh, there were no funky, you know, characters on the screen if it loaded the software. And then yeah, so this was interesting. So fine. What was you know the first usable basic program you wrote? Bah, no idea. Completely no idea. I have to admit, I, I later on I kind of stopped computer stuff and fell into electronics because my. Uh, the, the husband of my bigger sister was uh, electronician, and so I got in tinkering with with transistors and and concrete um, seventy four oh oh NAND and so on uh, stuff like that. So there have been a period after this this first computer things mm -hmm. where I fell into analog and um, and digital electronics mm -hmm. and. This was basically to probably till 86. Okay, so then, then a different question. What do, you, what do you manage to build with electronics back then? Oh gosh, uh, flip-flops. And there have been a few, there, there have been um, uh, electronic sets from Philips and from Cosmos. And a friend of mine had the electronic set from Philips, the experimental set. And I had the one from Cosmos, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I kind of, uh, it took me a few months to get the money, <laughs> so it was uh, pretty not that cheap back then. So it was, and to get it at all was, well, I think it was a a present for Christmas Eve or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I played with this a lot, and you have uh, schedules in there and uh, and samples and so on. What did I build? Uh, blinking lights and and sound and. They had an op amp, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, stuff like that. So okay. nothing big, but just you know, if you if you're a child with a few with ten years or so, and you see something blinking, and you made it yourself, then wow. Yeah. So you were ten. So this is remarkable. So, yeah. um, but yeah. of course, without the help of the, the my um, my my the, the her husband of my bigger sister, I wouldn't have been able to get there because he showed me. Another schematics, and and we extended this, uh, this tool set, and so on. And he, he uh, brought me transistors and and stuff like that, and PCBs. Mm -hmm. okay, cool. So, and after that, you came back to programming, right? Yes, with an Atari ST, ah. uh, a Mega ST from a, a friend. Uh, same story. He got everybody got an Amiga, uh, and he got an ST. And he had no clue what to do, so we we started tinkering together, and uh, did uh, things like logo and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and this was also fine. And later on in school, I did um, in in Austria. There's a school type uh, 
HTL, Höhere Technische Lehranstalt, mm -hmm. which is basically a, a small university degree at a very early level already. Is it in Vienna? Have, It's it's all over Austria. Okay, this There is are, like uh, okay, this is a degree. So not a school. It's a degree, right? It's a school. It's a school, but you you don't have the kind of in well, oh gosh, the education system in Austria. Um, usually, you go the 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 basic school four years, then you have the middle years yeah. uh, four years, and then you have the the, the late the latest part, um, which uh, finishes with a matura abitur. Yeah. Um, and you could, instead of this four years, uh, for 28 hours a uh, week, you could also do some schools which have a, uh, also, um, uh, um, which end with a degree and you have a lot of practice. So it's 40 hours per week and for five years. Mm -hmm. So it's a much more uh, effort in a little bit longer. But you have all the practice stuff. Okay. And the HTL for, for Nachrichtentechnik and Technische Informatik. Okay. So, um, yeah, high frequency electronics and computer science. Cool. Um, and in this school, I came back to compute PCs. I had my first 286 PC mm -hmm. from Commodore, funnily, <laughs> with a, a Commodore Einstein, PC? So. Yeah, Commodore PC 20. Interesting. It, it costed about, um, 25,000 shillings, mm -hmm. which was quite a bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is in Euro, um, is uh, divided by three, uh, right? Uh, no, no, uh, 13. Uh, 8,000 8, euros, seven. I think. No, 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 not that much. Um, it would be about 1,500 euros. Oh, that, because uh, I think shilling to German yeah. Deutschmark was seven. Factor seven, seven. Okay, so there is a three two. and a half or, or, or 14 is the question. 14, 14, 14. Yeah. okay, then it's uh, 3,000, okay. Yeah, something like that. So, um, and it was not that fast uh, and it had only a monochrome monitor, but uh, we, we tinkered with, with uh, Pascal and stuff in school. And in school, we also had a, a digital equipment PDP-8E <laughs> with 20 megs of disk. Uh, an ancient thing, but um, so this room full of computer back then it has been 15 or 20 years old and we got donated by a company to our school. And this is where we kind of did our first um, Großrechner, our mm -hmm. host mm -hmm. operating programming. <laughs> okay, and you enjoyed that? I enjoyed it. And later on, the school also had the first sunboxes, the pizza boxes. Oh, interesting. And which This, programming language was it back then in your school? Uh, first, we started with C mm -hmm. and then, uh, sorry, uh, Pascal. And then in the second grade, we started with C and C later on, very later on with C++. So what was, was actually your first program you wrote, which you remember, which was somehow <laughs> unique, usable or fun or whatever? Gosh. I have no idea anymore. So oh, really, really, this is, this is was the the this was in the eighties. So yeah, um, I know I know my first uh, shop um, for for industry, mm -hmm. uh, and this was kind of a mixture between uh, electronics and programming. And so, a teacher of mine had a, a, a company um, and. He, he developed stuff for other companies. And one of the things he built was a drinkomat, which is a, a drinking portioning machine uh -huh. with electronic counter and so on. And he was really a, a geek in electronics. And he made a two PCB stacked uh, system of concrete uh, electronics with timers on and so on to make it happen. And I uh, had... A folder of a PIC micro microchip PIC controller, microcontroller, mm -hmm. which was probably in the mm -hmm, must have been 1990 or something like that. Okay. And uh, out of fun, we created a, a board, a smallish board with just a microcontroller uh, and a few assembler uh, instructions, and kind of had the same. He he had kind of uh, two layers of Euro PCBs, uh, concrete electronics, and we did it in kind of a few quadrat centimeters mm -hmm. with this microcontroller. <laughs> and then he 
was completely floored and he, he bought us some evaluation kits. Mm -hmm. I must have this around uh, at home with my parents somewhere. It was of the one of the first uh, microchip pick microcontrollers. Mm -hmm. uh, ultraviolet light erasable. <laughs> okay. Uh, and yes, and then I started doing real programming for industry. Okay. And also combined with uh, this was hardware plus software. Okay. Which industry was it? Well, this this was this kind of uh, this portioning system. Okay. This drink okay. portioning system. And then later on in the what industry, was it? milk, was... vodka, water, no, no, rather vodka <laughs> stuff okay. like that. This was for bars. Okay. It was kind of the the problem of the with the bars is that they kind of uh, sold uh, lots of stuff which they shouldn't sell, and yeah, you know, uh, the cash wasn't always in sync with the the alcohol amount yeah. and so on. And you know this probably nowadays this is kind of standard, but in the early nineties this was a thing. Okay, and I also remember um, the the head for the bottles. It, it was the very first 3D printing I saw ever. He made the... So this, this was a brilliant guy. Um, uh, he made the prototypes with 3D printing, which was kind of... Uh, there was haven't been few of them. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a plastic liquid, which got uh, hardened with, with laser. So really expensive. Mm -hmm. But it was worth it because the prototyping phase was kind of two days of waiting instead of making them, making a, a f for a plastic for for having a plastic. What's it? This this. Um, yeah, I know the. Um, yeah. How it's called the uh, uh, extruder, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a, it's a high pressure thing, and uh -huh. you have to do the Werkzeug. It's so you, Werkzeug. you need the tooling where you have the tooling. You know, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the from, print tool. Yeah. Where the, the negative thing, yeah. fluid is plastic is the injected yeah. and right, yes, yeah. And this was in the past times. This have been done with with wood and stuff like that mm -hmm. for prototyping. Uh, and he did it. He was he did the very first three D printing I ever saw. What what the guy what the guy is doing right now? You know it. Oh, he's in pension. And okay. I hope he's doing well because you know this is uh, four years ago. Okay. So he's sure in pension. Okay. Interesting. In, in in our school, we had a lot of people who were from the industry. Uh, one of the people who, yeah, so many extremely clever guys and ladies, but most of them had a heart attack and then they kind of uh, stopped doing um, uh, industry and went to school for teaching. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Why they got the heart attack? You know, stress. Yeah, sure, definitely. Okay. So this guy has been the development chief of a big company. Okay. Yes. So and then um, after your uh, solved alcoholing portioning problems, <laughs> <laughs> I, I the next job was again uh, in the medical industry. Okay. I, I remember the name Gab in Berlin. It was oh. so we we worked in in Austria, mm -hmm. but the the company we did this for was uh, a Berlin company, and this was uh, was medical testing equipment okay so this is for insulin infusion pumps you have to test those pumps uh and this company made the 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 devices for the tuf and the austrian health ministry to check those devices if you have a, a defibrillator for example mm -hmm. then you have to check the voltage level otherwise you use it on a person and you're going to be grilled <laughs> yes <laughs> so and for doing those tests uh you need some special hardware again mm -hmm. and those things became more and more complicated and they were also started to introduce microcomputers okay uh, microcontrollers so i did the pcbs and the software for those things were you freelancer back then or yes okay as a student so basically okay. a side job for a student cool and your first contact with Java. So, how many jobs you had be, uh, between you know the medicine stuff and I, Java? I did a lot of uh, C++ programming uh, on OS two actually okay. in those early nineties days, and I started with the Glockenspiel C++. 
mm-hmm. compiler, which was as actually not a, a C++ uh, compiler, but it transpiled C++ to C code. Mm-hmm. That's that's the reason why I still know how virtual function pointer tables and stuff work. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, if you write the C code and you see the, the, the structures and the function pointers in, if you write the C++ code mm-hmm. and then let the Glockenspiel run over it, and then you see the intermediate C files, mm-hmm. which then get compiled to native bytecode mm-hmm. um, or meshing code, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, then you understand how all those things work internally. Uh, and I have a lot of OS2, C++ programming and Windows service programming and stuff like that in those days. Mm-hmm. And then in... Well, at the university, we tinkered a little bit with Java, and it was, yeah, interesting. Uh, and then Which in, version was it, you remember? Wow, 102 or something okay. like that. It must have been 1996. And how you got it? So univer- as a, At the university. Yeah, but someone who didn't know to pick Java, so it was interesting... Probably because of the sun stations, right? So there we should be no sun. Yeah, uh, we we had sun. <laughs> we also had next steps back over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had sun. We had alpha, mm-hmm. uh, tech alpha, sixty four CPU boxes, mm-hmm. but also a few suns. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, just played a little bit with it. This was not. I I wouldn't say I could program Java back then. Uh, this started then when I was working at uh, uh, at a company who made uh, which made uh, software for stock exchanges and banks. Wow! Mm-hmm. And so, for example, the the German uh, Wertpapiermitteilungsschnittstelle and okay. stuff like that. Ge- and they mm-hmm. they started to work. How, how to translate yeah. the German uh, Wertpapier is like uh, German st- st- uh, stocks uh, so, or uh, st- it's not. No, it's yeah, stocks. Yeah, it's stocks. Yeah. Stocks. Uh, Mitteilung is uh, uh, notification uh, API. Yeah, it's German stock, stock it's, notification it's, it's, API, something like this. Yeah, it, it's uh, market trader information basically, and uh, yeah, and. Uh, this company invested very early in Java mm-hmm. and we had a few excellent guys like Sigi Göschel, Siegfried Göschel and Martin Peschel, which is, uh, is sadly he's dead already. But the two guys, um, Sigi uh, started uh, the Maven plugins, Maven one plugins project, for example. Interesting. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, Martin was one of the first Cocoon, Jakarta PMCs and so on. Um, this is so why this... why I know him. He he attended a lots of Jax conferences in Germany with the cocoon stuff, right? Wow, I, I'm not, not quite sure if Jax already existed. No, it uh, existed uh, it, in 2000. But what I remember, there are lots yeah. of nice cocoon guys. They had frequent that... workshops, you know. Um, and that I th- might be, yeah. mm-hmm. because of the name Martin Peschel. Two thousand three or four, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Way too early. Mm-hmm. Was a brilliant and really really open-minded nice guy anyway um where did we stop <laughs> so uh there was uh uh you, yeah, you and, worked and for did, the did, company with the you know, stock notifications mm-hmm. okay. yes and they did really java stuff back then because they they saw the the potential mm-hmm. and then i got into it again with with j run and uh oh, exactly apache <laughs> and and what j uh, no borland j builder mm-hmm. As IDE. <laughs> of course. Gosh, old memories of oh, hell. But, but, but Jebel, that was actually great. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it was the best uh, mm-hmm. IDE back then because actually there haven't been that many. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was, for those times, it was really okay. It, uh, it, it looked nice and uh, it was innovative. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And J Run was also okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was really slow compared to C back then. Mm-hmm. But well, uh, J but... Run was the servlet engine, right? J Run was a... it. It wasn't servlet. It was just an. It wasn't the servlet specification didn't exist back then. Yeah, yeah. But this, uh... it was in the making probably, but yeah. not even sure it was. It's, it's, it was like servlet engine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It was kind of the web container. Mm-hmm. And then I uh, got called to another shop uh, where the the Austrian um, insurance, co- a few Austrian insurance companies wanted to make a platform. This was in 
1999. Mm -hmm. And they had a bunch of basic programmers, but they needed a server software. Mm -hmm. It was kind of, it still exists, the Österreichische um, Versicherungsmakler platform. Okay. So the Austrian insurance makler platform. And it was kind of a bunch of um, big insurance companies and makers uh, decided that, well, uh, they should make a, a platform they all could use and, and share uh, yeah, for the, for the customers mm -hmm. and the marketers, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and there I got contracted. It, this was in 1999. And we did use Lutris and Hydra. Ah, uh, ex and exactly. This was a French... Uh, French uh... No, no, Canadian, I think. Uh, American-Canadian. And you know the 2K blast yeah. and so on. And it later bombed up and went bankrupt. But uh, it was... Uh, really really ex okay ish program i thought they were from french but this anhydra i also bumped into it it was a full application server yes uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and it was using apache tomcat which was kind of freshly donated to apache back then so in, uh, and I, I remember exactly I, I shipped a few patches to anhydra which probably went upstream to apache back then but uh, uh, it was donated by sun right so that, uh, Tomcat was donated by Sun to yeah, a exactly. This was the, the 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 start of Tomcat because Sun had this Java servlet web development kit, and mm -hmm. they uh, donated to Apache. Then how Tomcat started, right? Yes, and I, I, it definitely was Tomcat already. So it must have been in the late ninety nine, early two thousand. Mm -hmm. I have, I remember we went live on the first or in the third January of. Uh, 2000 so it must have been late 99 mm -hmm. um, and it was completely funny and looks totally different than Chuck, uh, than Tomcat today and mm -hmm. Catalina mm -hmm. uh, they, they completely rewrote it afterwards mm -hmm. but uh, so for example if you send a redirect I, and I remember because I fixed the bug there it internally it threw an, a Java lang error okay a redirect or, or, serv or server redirect error something like that mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, if people usually don't catch throwable, they shouldn't, and yeah. errors, but only exceptions, this kind of went through, get catched uh, at the top somewhere, and then this redirect log logic um, did run. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, from back then, we have the best practice, you know, never control the flow with exceptions, right? <laughs> yeah, it was weird, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. But, yeah, that's, that's how it worked back then. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure um, it did leave many memory leaks and resource leaks because I, I'm, I wouldn't bet that everybody didn't understand how finally blocks work back then, <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> including me, of course. Mm -hmm. But, you know. That, this is interesting. Uh, so you remember me and, and Hydra already and J-Run mm -hmm. almost forgotten. And uh, do you remember Chixa? It was the Apache servlet engine. Uh, no. Yeah, no, this is no. was uh, also I I somehow I used a little bit J run and then there was a chick. So this was Apache servlet mm -hmm. engine. It was independent from Tomcat. I also play with that a little bit. No. Okay. No clue. I didn't touch this. <laughs> okay. But but they had a funny uh, this this and Hydra stuff had a funny way to generate uh, to serve HTML code. It wasn't kind of like JSF or JSP. It was you you wrote HTML. And then you had a build step in ARNT. Mm -hmm. um, and it compiled this, it parsed the HTML, the, the, um, HTML made some DOM tree basics, DOM tree in Java, basically, mm -hmm. XMLC, it was called. And then you can, could kind of duplicate uh, rows and stuff like that or fill values. So you could kind of uh, have DOM manipulation, but all in pure Java. Mm -hmm. Of course, not, not what we know today in the, in the DOM interface of Java, but completely separated in the own stuff. Uh, but it worked really well. And then you could modify uh, this HTML code in Java, fill in values, duplicate lines and stuff like that. And this, then you send it write it to a string and uh, send it out to the response. Interesting idea, actually, right? And uh, the database stuff was also pretty amazing, actually. So you kind of had an XML where you defined the data structure. 
and it created data access objects for you plus the queries. So you had kind of one XML with the data structure and another XML where you can define for various databases the queries. Mm -hmm. So it generated one set of Java objects, but mm -hmm. you had the, the adoption to the database in XML externalized. Mm -hmm. And then it did create Java code out of it at build time. Yeah. And then it was pretty fast and worked also really, really well because it was so small. You didn't have any library or so, just the code you generated. Yeah, no dependency, of course. Yeah. So, so interesting approach. Yeah. Uh, I thought Justice and Hydra was from f France. I don't know why. Probably it's, it's Canadian. There was some French doc or something. But... No, it later got contributed. It was originally it was from the US or Canada. Okay. But it later got contributed to OW2. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But this was way later. Okay. When, when the, the original company filed bankruptcy. Okay. And uh, after Anhydra, what you did then with Java? So the, you're, you are then, I would say, so pretty pretty deep in uh, in server-side programming with that experience. So what was uh, the next project? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Or a couple oh. of projects. So what was your journey to? Oh. Ooh, uh, I, I did, in parallel, I also did a lot of Windows and OS2 programming still. OS2 was on the decline, but uh, the Windows programming, it was one of the few guys who were able to uh, to write services in Windows. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of the, in Austria, was a few handful of people who, who did service programming for Windows. And one thing I also did is, for example, the German Reichstag. <laughs> oh. uh, I hope you replaced all that code by now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so I, I, I bet you are one of the few guys who, was, uh, who, who is master of uh, Windows and Java at the same time. Not, not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah, but you were. You know, back then, you know, the back Java then, yeah. Windows people didn't like each other. I, I didn't uh, like uh, C sharp and stuff like that. Okay. But I, I well, C sharp I, came way later, right? Well, two thousand two, two thousand three, or so. Yeah. Yeah. One. It was. It was about that time. Okay. I have to look up the dates, but it felt like it was pretty much at that time when it came up. But I, 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 I try to remember when I met you the first time. I think. Was it before CDI or you became active, you know, on the enterprise Java scene with the advent of CDI? Oh, gosh. I uh, When we looked at this this um, insurance company stuff, we actually went to alternatives or went through all the alternatives. And I did, I remember I did read one of the very early EGB drafts, mm -hmm. 08 or something like that. And mm -hmm. it was a nightmare, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I was never a fan of EGP mm -hmm. um, because it was, you know, back then you had four classes, IDL generated, the, the home interface and Remote stuff, interface. And the remote. Oh, There's a serialized uh, <laughs> configuration, which was, yes. uh, which has to be written as a Java config like yeah. DSL and then serialized. Yes. yes. Uh, on that the, note, the, very, very, sorry, very sorry, briefly. Adam, the, the thing is, I knew how it can, could do could be implemented better because uh, I, I briefly explained that I also had uh, at the computer science department we had some next boxes and I worked with distributed objects. DCOM? No, 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 no. no I, I also programmed DCOM, but this is a hell of a nightmare. If you program DCOM in Microsoft, then you have to kind of have a big switch and if yeah yeah if this is what i thought the so command what? string mm -hmm. is this string then go to this method this is completely bollocks mm -hmm. and um no but the distributed objects from next mm -hmm. okay uh, I, I, and I don't know is, this i have no idea what it is so how it works um, how it works uh objective c Okay. Objective C okay. is coming from yeah. Next. So you're sending and messages and they are resolved on the other side. It, it's basically the interface approach. Mm -hmm. And you, you just have to deploy it in another box and have to, uh, have to kind of, it picks it up automatically with a broadcast. Mm -hmm. So who can deliver it? So that the balancing and stuff is, is, uh, is handled out of the box from these things. So you have to do basically nothing in your code. You just have the interface and if it's not here, and you declare it's it's remote, then it, it works, and the system will find the way to the the printer's uh, service, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, if you know 
Objective C uh, distributed objects from Next, mm -hmm. and then you you see the EGP remote spec. Then you see, wow, this is a weird combination of Corbo, and let's do a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, it's it, you understand that this is just not working that way as it could technically. So a uh, funny side note, um, I don't know whether you already attended the JAX conference. It was, I think, one of the last in Frankfurt, not in Mainz. And this was 10 yeah. years of JAX, Java, JAX, um, Java, AP, uh, this is the, the, the German larger J Java conference, I would say. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I attended all of the JAX conferences. I skipped last year one because I forgot to uh to propose uh, i proposed the title but i forgot about the abstract <laughs> and they cancelled my talks but back then uh this was 10 years of jacks and i think it was 2010 and they called all the speakers who actually did something in the year 2000 what were the sessions and i was on stage and all the other speakers and the funny story was i was the only one who uh, who had something without EGBs. I didn't like EGBs at all back then. And uh, like you, I ran, not JRun, I used uh, Java Web Server and uh, the Chixo, and we built our own stuff with uh, servlets, Java Beans, and um, I would say like almost like, you know, a proxy-based uh, transaction. So we started the transaction before the Java Bean was executed. So I was actually, we had everything already, And the whole JAX conference in 2001, everyone, so all the people who are now against EGBs, there were absolutely no EGB, EGB. All the talks about EGB and that's something, one talk about caching and one talk about servlets. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> start to laugh and say, okay, why I didn't you know, uh, talk about EGBs? Like those, because back then they were stupid. They, the only thing which I liked was actually the Java confidentialization. It was way better than the XML, which came later. But uh, yeah, this is also funny, uh, side note, that uh, I was one of the few who actually didn't like the first EGBs. I, I, I couldn't even got the idea, like, which problem does it solve? And um, yeah. It was a huge hype topic back then. And it's probably, it's, it was filled by Microsoft, as weird as it looks or sounds. MTS, so, uh, Microsoft uh, Transactions. Decom. Yeah. No, no, the, the DCOM stuff. So my my understanding or my, my view on those, those history things is that First, there was uh, the the next uh, distributed objects things, which worked like really like a charm. Mm -hmm. And then Microsoft saw that they, they, it was a lot of bus in there. Mm -hmm. And Microsoft uh, had come and they kind of added something to make it remote. This was then DCOM, distributed yes. common object model. Mm -hmm. and But it was horrible to program. But um, from the systematic and what they tried to achieve... <laughs> my daughter, sorry. Yeah, it can be you. <laughs> okay. She's programming um, already? No. <laughs> But she's handling tablets and stuff. Yeah, very good. Um, so, um, and uh, Microsoft had a lot, took a lot, take a lot of money in it, their hand and um, pushed DCOM. So all the newspapers were full with advertisement for DCOM. Uh, and so IBM and Sun have been on the fans and they kind of had to have an answer for this mm -hmm. because Microsoft pushed heavily on the marketing front. Mm -hmm. It, DCOM wasn't technically working really well, but they pushed for it so heavily. All the papers are, have been full of advertisement. Mm -hmm. And that, that's my view how HEP started to became alive because they simply... Corba. Corba was at the same time as EGP. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Corba and EGP and they merged together. Yeah, and, and what's uh, also interesting, because you're interested in, in, in history, if you there was an old product from Microsoft called, uh, called MTS, Microsoft Transactions yeah, Server. Yeah. And the MTS had uh, the transaction levels and MTS, they were almost like EGBs. So there was mm -hmm. requires, new requires, it was almost like a copy from EGBs. Yes. No idea who came first, but it was very, very similar. HEP came first, but DCOM was before HEP. Yeah. So DCOM was the same, but without transactions. <laughs> and Microsoft uh, copied EGBs with MTS, and this was <laughs> interesting. Okay, yeah. cool. So did the EGB investigation didn't like that, and what happened then? No, oh, the, I, I didn't like the EGB investigation because it added a lot of overhead, and the kind of the thing was all is remote. Like today we say all is microservices, which mm -hmm. is completely the same bollocks. Yes. Because 
there are a few projects where microservices are really a good fit, like for example Netflix. Yeah. But uh, rarely, rarely business also business projects rarely have the same uh, um, criteria as like Netflix does. For example, Netflix doesn't need any transactions. Yeah, you are absolutely right. I, I mean, uh, and oh. and uh, in, in enterprises, more like you know, macro services or a little bit. Yeah, I would make it much. Of course, you always have a few boxes talking with each other, like SAP talking with your uh, your business server, and the business server is talking with some printing uh, street and so on. Yeah. Um, but um, so in in practice, bigger companies all have already have five or ten biggish applications but they're really biggish and inside those applications they have full transaction control and uh it's in, it's not so much that uh the transactions cannot be achieved via distributed uh handling it, it can with with eventing and but compensation crazy logic but it's it's crazy complex plus the people don't manage to do it yeah so uh, it's if if you have a problem in like a you say classic Java enterprise server and you forget to handle something and it bombs up, what happens? You get an exception and in some top level layer in your code, this exception gets catched and the whole transaction gets rolled back. Exactly. Of course, that's not nice for the user sitting on the screen because you get some some red message and some error message, but your data is still correct and yes. it's and your transactions are fine and that's so depending on your project it's so much more important to have a consistent data than to have a happy user for netflix they just don't care they don't have transactions hey mark uh, i will invite you in a few weeks a topic microservices we will talk one <laughs> hour about that if you have time okay, we will de- do it definitely so definitely we should do this no no kidding i think uh, we are on the same uh, the same opinion actually yesterday at conference i said exactly the same we are not netflix facebook and google if you try so, you know uh, uh just you know copy what they are doing mm-hmm. your business is probably not going to be successful because these companies have completely different set of problems right yeah perfect so forget microservices we uh yeah. and uh, <laughs> w- what you did so you didn't like EJBs. So you took a look yeah. at uh, the distributed objects, and what no. happened then? We we yeah, this this was kind of uh, the thing where we we uh, decided to use an Hydra and XMSC and dots and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and later on, then I did some C stuff again and C plus uh, plus, and then I did Napster Mobile, for example. In must have been two thousand four, two thousand five. Uh, this was funny because it was kind of delivering uh, 60 million customers. AT and T music uh, was 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 kind of it was kind of a mini Netflix back then. Yeah, and, and which programming <laughs> language you did it in Java? This hey, was Java. This is this is this is great. Uh, with the with servlets with the raisin. Uh, uh, the, uh, raisin this was, was with raisin. Yeah, this was, what was the company behind raisin? This was great. Culture. Yeah, Caucho Raisin, where Reza Rehman yeah. was from uh, from Caucho, from Raisin. Yeah. The Raisin is very okay. thin, yeah. lean, and yeah, fast uh, servlet uh, engine. Right now, they yeah. just stopped no. operating somehow, but yeah. I have no idea what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Back in the days, it was really good because they had a lot of uh, native parts which uh, in, the, in the network stack. So the, the business stuff was all Java, and they kind of switched out... Uh, um, a lot of this this hardcore uh, worker thread handling and stuff like that, and the network parts to native C code, mm-hmm. and uh, this was really fast back then because you know the, the just in time uh, compiler and the hotspot engine was not that perfect as it is right now, mm-hmm. uh, and it was really fast. And the benefits you get to Java with the memory handling is is incredible. I sometimes have to, you know, I'm working for big banks and stuff and doing uh, transitions of old COBOL things for pension funds and whatever. And you often see those COBOL structures. And whenever you see these things, then you you understand what the benefit of Java is. In the old C and and COBOL days, you had to kind of create one big-ish structure 
which contains all the variables you need yeah. in a request. Wait a second, are you still freelancer? This was a free uh, yes, freelancer, yeah. And you are still a freelancer right now? Uh, I got con uh, I got employed uh, three years ago by a spin-off of the Technical University of Vienna called RICE. Oh, okay. And we're doing a lot of industry, high-level industry stuff. Hey, cool. It's, it's simply because, you know, the um, Krankenkassen kind yeah. of... I, I was working for 10 years with this company. And, ah, uh, okay, yeah. this is the problem. Okay. Uh, you it shines yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot claim. work too long also in Germany for one company. Otherwise, yeah. uh, as freelancer, you get a trouble. Okay. So, so they employ me um, now. And it's what's... What uh, interests me right now is just your, you know, Napster stuff. How many clients or what were the numbers? So how, so how many people used your Resin engine and how many Resin engine were in production? So how many nodes you had, you know, to handle the traffic? Just so. Oh, this, this have been a few. Birgish Sun, what was this? 440 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, MySQL, because MySQL was 10 times faster than Oracle. Mm -hmm. Uh, without transaction, so mm -hmm. the myism, yeah. because uh, we we didn't again we didn't we we optimized for read throughput yeah. because you have uh, fifty clicks or hundred clicks uh, through this thing and then you have one purchase mm -hmm. and uh, um, don't don't uh, don't tell anyone yeah. <laughs> uh, also the, the backbone for for Jamba. Ah, this was the the the. Uh... <laughs> Call, call phones. Yeah. Right? Uh, call... I have nothing to do with the content. Yeah. Don't blame me for anything. But okay. it was really interesting from the infrastructure point of view. Okay. And how many? How many nodes? How many instances of JVMs ran on the servers? Don't ask me. About. I, 10, I know 20... it was. Oof, yeah, yeah, about that. It was mm -hmm. sixty million customers. Wow. And it was terabytes, which was back then was huge. Yeah. Terabytes of of twenty five terabyte. Of, uh, of of songs. Yeah. It was back then. It was really really huge. When was it? Two thousand six. Two thousand five. Two thousand six. Okay. Something like that. Oh, remarkable. Okay. Cool projects you did. Well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, then... I I I had the impression you stick at the university and do some boring research. You know, <laughs> with uh, and now it's it's it came out. You know. Uh, no, I I it just. I, I'm the university thing. I, I just do lecturing as, as a side. I'm from the industry okay. and just do a few kind of uh, guest, guest lectures. Okay. Um, and But I'm working with a, for a spin off of the technical university, and the professor is an excellent guy. And cool. so we always got thrown into um, projects which are really under fire. And I there are there are three kind of projects roughly. Wait a second. Uh, we have uh, what interests me is uh, right now because I'm thinking all the time. Is what was the next step to CDI? Because uh, you are the CDI guy more or less. Uh, <laughs> okay. Open Web Beans Apache, yeah. and uh, back then yes. you did something with resin. And mm -hmm. uh, 2006, and I think uh, a little bit later came CDI. So what was your road to CDI? Um, well. Um... Gurkhan uh, started to think along with this and said, "Oh, let's do an incubation project." Uh, and so, and I liked it, um, and I started hacking with him on this thing. And then we became a top-level project and also contributed to the specification. When was it? Two thousand. Late 2008, early 2009, something like that. So, and what happened in the two years between, you know, Resin and CDI? There was some we, other we interesting... Did I, I also did uh, kind of uh, things with Spring, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a lot of things. For example, the, the back end, the complicated part about software delivery or uh, um, content delivery, this might be the same for Netflix, is not the delivery actually... This is a technical problem where you get out tons of, of, of gigabytes or terabytes of data per second. But the really interesting thing is the, the, the payment uh, from the, the content owners. So for CBS and, and stuff like that. Um, and you, as a content delivery platform and content sales platform, you have a, a few hundred or thousand, uh, different contracts with all those vendors, the content vendors. And for 
making the calculations each month, we had an internal project which took up a lot of time uh, where we did this calculation because usually the, uh, before that they did the calculations on Excel and it was not handled. They, they couldn't handle this. So what we did is we created an application um, which you had kind of the basic options and then you can fill in some groovy scripts because you in the, in the content delivery, you have some really weird content uh, contracts where you say, if you sell three songs from the top 10 in the Austrian lists, which are also top 10 in the German uh, lists, then it costs this amount of money per purchase. And if you... Uh, sell more than 10,000 of those songs, then it's kind of a rabat of 20% and so on. So you, so, so you were able to switch the logic without redeploying, right? Yeah, exactly. Because the, the, the bill clerks have been able to kind of hack those parts in Groovy and restore these Groovy parts to the database. And so they have been able to kind of manage all their contracts in an application, and on the the end of the month, they just had to click once and tuck. Yes. And without going through thousands of Excel sheets and filling in the numbers and copying them over and making errors and whatever. And you did it, of course, with JDK 1.6.2.2.3 JavaScripting uh, API. No, no, no. Yeah, later on. But before that, uh, we did it, I think, with hard-coded groovy stuff. Okay. This is... I remember this this Napster stuff was mostly on Java one four still. Okay, so this and was the, then the only was Java one four was not available. Okay, I I, I don't remember yeah. exactly. Sigi did this part of mm -hmm. the integration. So so you did this, yeah. and then uh, what, what I don't get is uh, you did a little bit of Spring. <laughs> yeah. And why you started with CDI? So if you already had Spring, you should be happy, right? Okay, we we had a, in two thousand nine. Um, so I, I started doing CDI and because I didn't like all this XML configuration, also the annotation based in conf configuration of Spring didn't kind of deliver in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And CDI was really a prom promising thing. And I liked it from the start when it was still called WebBeans, which is also the reason why the Apache project is still called Open WebBeans. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really did miss, I did lots of JSF back then. And I really did miss uh, kind of a good way to have a glue code between the front end and the, the back end parts, mm -hmm. which could do basically the same like AGB, but over all the stack. Mm -hmm. And CDI solved this. Mm -hmm. And in 2009, uh, this was to, the reason why Open Weapons was so great uh, already in the beginning. In 2009, we got thrown into a project. You know, I am always a firefighter. Uh, I got thrown into projects which are completely broken. Mm -hmm. And they, they uh, tried to refactor a PHP application for five years. Mm -hmm. A huge application. I can't, don't say names and so on. And they can't make it happen. Facebook. And then, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah. A little bit smaller, yeah. mm, but yeah. uh, their their the technical crowd hired some Java guys, and they said, "Well, we do this now in Sim two, because we we they started with Ruby, and Ruby was is great, but back then in two thousand nine, Groovy heavily changed every three months. Mm -hmm. So they they kind of the parts they started in Groovy." Uh, just they had more work to do with updating to the latest Groovy versions than uh, uh, doing new business logic. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other part wanted to look into Sim 2 and when I came to the table and say, oh gosh, we have now 10 months to deliver a thing because there was a political date. They had to deliver something otherwise they all got killed and would have been an, uh, an investigation. Uh, so it's it's almost impossible to solve this. Let's have fun at least. Mm -hmm. And then we started to tinker with uh, CDI uh, and JSF2 because we were kind of, the, the opinion was formed that it doesn't make any sense to 
to bet on Sim 2 because we know I, I knew exactly uh, Gavin is uh, about to kill Sim 2 because there is no investment anymore in Sim 2. Mm-hmm. So, and it, it later turned out to be true. Yes. And, and if so you say it, Gavin, you mean Gavin King? His Gavin King, no, yeah, yeah, the right. Hibernate yeah. and Sim and yeah, sure. CDI guy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and knowing Gavin, talking with him and Pete Muir and so on, it was clear that Sim 2 didn't have a future. So I said, no, let's not do, go down this route. Let's try out and have fun. Because in 10 months, it's almost impossible we deliver. Mm-hmm. But at least we'll let, let's have fun. And so we we kind of took what we had in CDI, which was back then still web beans, and started hacking out a prototype. And it was running better than everything else. Mm-hmm. And then we saw a lot of performance problems and uh, we started improving open web pins. We kind of in parallel, I hacked on my faces to the GSF2 specification and open GPA too. And so basically all the Java E6 stuff, bean validation, we started doing bean validation implementation um, and helping the guys out there, which was a new incubation project in Apache at this time. There was a tons of things going on. If you see, if you look at the projects I'm involved in Apache, a lot of those projects, except Maven, which I'm kind of involved since very long ago, um, a lot of those other projects, these Java E projects, were from the time of 2009, 2010-ish, yeah. where Java E6 started to become real because I simply wanted to get this thing in production. And we have been productive with the very first part in january 2010 Mm -hmm. this was a month after the java e6 specification was um was shipped a huge success actually right uh and and in september 2010 we we kind of switched it on to live and on the first day of going live we had five million impressions yeah this is remarkable actually Mm -hmm. yeah and we, we didn't kind of go down <laughs> mm-hmm. so we had a peak of twelve thousand requests per minute uh, how, how much twelve thousand requests per minute okay not bad um what uh, what what interests me why you hack so much on apache and didn't use for instance the red hat stuff or, or jboss back then uh because jboss didn't exist then the, the, oh, the I mean, this, uh, the, the, the head world... Uh, world? No, nothing. nothing. Editions, it, didn't, right? it didn't exist back then. Okay. And, no. uh, yeah, prototypes, but nothing professional. Okay, so you were forced to do that. Otherwise, there would be nothing used. Okay, I understand. Yeah, and also, it's, it's you know, I'm involved at the patches since quite some time. And, uh, yeah, I, I didn't... Do you, I know you are a big fan of Glassfish. I'm not that much. <laughs> Because it um, always felt like a hobby project. To I mean, there have been times where Glassfish was really, really cool, good. Um, but after Oracle took over, it it was kind of yeah. It, it was kind that, of a yeah. sidekick. Uh, I, sidekick I, I, I actually, fan. I'm not. N- I'm not a fan of Glassfish. What uh, What happened is a uh, completely different mindset, right? So if you Let's say if you have clients and they use mm-hmm. Java 6 or Java 7 yeah. um, and Glassfish was the reference implementation and you could buy support, for me, it was yeah, you know, yeah. the, the first choice because it was the, the, the first non-political choice. I don't have to discuss whether Whitefly, mm-hmm. uh, WebSphere, whatever. We pick the reference implementation and if you like buy support, you know, discussion is over. This was my approach. I didn't like mm-hmm. to talk, you know, about the business and, 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 and all the behind the scenes. So this was a reasonable choice. But now Payara is great. The uh, yeah. Glassfish at Oric is rubbish. So Payara is like, you know, uh, Glassfish with several thousand uh, fixed bucks. So Payara is absolutely usable. Glassfish is a research project, more or less. I wouldn't use it in production. Yes. Yeah. But the, the people of Poyara are also really nice and yeah. welcoming. And uh, if you have kind of, let's say, deal with them on a business level, just call them and ask them for something special. They they will talk with you. Yeah. yeah. That's a really nice yeah. mindset. So yeah. Also, uh, all the Java vendors right now are really, really nice to. Yeah. What uh, if we are at conferences? Tommy you know the Tommy Tribe and Payara yeah. and awesome. uh, Open Liberty. They you know they flock together on conferences, have nice chats. So this is really a really nice community. I have to say, 
I'm really pleasantly surprised always how nice the Java E community actually is. So you always have fun and uh, yeah, it's a very inclusive community. Um, yeah. What's what's also interesting in your case, you know, there's always the impression that I can know Java is the ivory tower. And you are the perfect example. It was not the case. You were forced to deliver and you built, you know, in parallel, the open source project, which was battle proof, you know, three months later. So you built, you know, the project according to the spec and fixed your production bugs and hopefully donated the bugs back, you know, to Apache. Well, that's this. Uh, not bugs, uh, the fixes, uh, sorry. <laughs> a, a, lo a lot of, a lot of uh, people don't understand why um, people are doing open source. Um, and I, I had a talk uh, in, in, at, at the, the, the legal university in Vienna um, with one of the founders of Open Access, and he asked me, "So you know, I know why I'm doing Open Access, um, and it's because we we need kind of to share all this information across the universities. But why why are you doing open um, open source? Is this just for showing off?" I said, "No, you, you completely don't understand open source. It seems." Uh, open source consists of 95% or 98% of tools. So the real benefit of, uh, of open source is to not have to invent all those tools yourself. You make the end product, which is your product, which is kind of your business stuff. And you actually, uh, you want to share the costs of the whole tool set you need for doing your business stuff with the others and yes. the others have the same project problem. And this is the reason why I do open source. It's to share costs, it's to share experience, it's to share testing because, you know, if you do it yourself, even if you are a company, you even cannot afford to do the testing, the battle testing. It's yeah. so hugely expensive. And for open source projects, you basically get a lot of people who kind of share those costs. Yeah. And uh, there's another way to contribute back to open source um the, the the pragmatic reason is you know to prevent forks so if you are yeah. working for a company and you already have an open source project in place if you find some extension source bugs is a wiser to contribute it back otherwise you will have maintained your patches and uh, if new release happens uh, you are screwed so you will have you will have you know to understand what what the upstream project did and then you know reapply your patches which is always painful Yes, and uh, you always get important feedback because you might have a good idea, but it might be only good at the first glance and it uh, later might turn out to be uh, a dead road. And um, you will get this feedback pretty early on if you're doing it in the open and you get reviews. So the quality will be really way better. Yeah. But this is like you cannot, you know, explain it to managers. But with the fork, it is explainable. Say, look, if we, ah, okay. will, yeah, this is this is a little bit more political. But uh, say the quality is is not that measurable. What is really measurable, if you if you go to a company, say, look, if we just have a patch and we don't contribute it back, you will have to give me another, you know, budget to to fix it if if they release. Uh, a new version or, or security patch, which is important these days. Yes. The other thing is that, uh, gosh, um, if you have your own fork, then this company is forever depending on this one person who did this fork because it's, exactly. it's not documented anywhere. It does some special things. It might do something different than Absolutely. the documented upstream version. So it's also about why are, uh, why are people doing JPA? It's not because JPA is so good. It's, it, I, it does some things good, but then it's way too much magic, actually. But you find millions of answers to problems. Yeah. yeah exactly. Sharing knowledge is so underrated. This is exactly the same Java, you know. It's not like uh, we use Java because it's not a secret source to, 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 to build kick-ass apps. No, I learned the stuff once. I don't care about your runtimes, and I just focus on business. This is actually why I like the whole Java stuff. I agree. Right. What do you think about the Java X versus Jakarta E? Is this yeah, exactly. This was actually the reason <laughs> why I wanted to talk with you about that. But um, um, what's uh, did something significant happen before we start with that uh, after your Java six contribution and now? Uh, tons of other projects I'm not allowed to talk with, but it's basically um, um, most of the time. I I try to to 
to come back to this project thing, to this project categorization. In my opinion, there are three kinds of projects. The ones who run really, really well already, and you have a perfect team and uh, management and so on. And then there is the third, I skipped the second for a second, the third one, which is completely broken. And this is the ones I'm interested in because the, the second category, the ones who are problematic, but the problems are not so big that it kind of bubbles up to the top. Mm -hmm. Then you have a lot of managers in the middle who want to kind of mitigate the problems and uh, kind of hide it away from the management and so on. And this creates a lot of tensions and a lot of problems. You don't have, if you want to fix things, you don't get the backing from the managers. So I basically always only touch projects which are either completely good and want to to to, um, to add sugar icing on the top uh, or which are completely broken and the top level management has to admit it already. Exactly. Because then you get the management backing to fix it. Yeah. And this is where I also spend my time in. You call it uh, firefighting. I do firefighting, task forces, open source, open source code yeah. reviews. This is what I do a huge amount of my time as well. So, and now back to what, what did I do between 2010? Well, quite a lot of projects. Basically, uh, Java E6 was such a success that I, I spent a lot of time with Java E6 projects and yes. still do. And many IBM customers, for example, because WebSphere is based on on tons of, of Apache projects. Yes. And so whenever they need kind of uh, short-term fixes or understanding, then they call me. So, yeah, cool. And yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. So now back to JavaX and uh, Jakarta. So I, I was actually uh, surprised by amount of, you know, of hysteria on, on the blogs because I was not aware of the issue at the beginning. And I said, okay, Oracle donates the, the whole source code to to Jakarta e and uh, or to uh, Eclipse and and it's actually solved i was only a little bit concerned with the e4j namespace like this is a stupid name it cannot this will, they will never fly but reza for unknown reason so reza raman yeah. uh, told me hey uh, we have the issue with the java x namespace it is frozen and uh, eclipse guys cannot cannot use that and uh, this happened at the very, very beginning. So it was like, uh, I think, a few months after the donation. So it is, the donation happened two years ago or something like that. So I said, okay, this is, uh, this is a huge problem for me uh, because uh, what I really like in Java E is actually the consistency. So whatever starts with Java X is, is, is Java E and anything else is not. Ha, and, that's not fully true. Yeah, but mostly. <laughs> um, I, I would say... It mostly true because uh, it is uh, it is uh, Java E and, and JDK, but it's, it, it is it is not a third party library. This is what I wanted yeah. to say. Yeah, and um, and, and it it got a little bit uh, not uh, after what happens one and a half year. I would say two years ago, I started to use Micro Profile. And the reason is uh, Micro Profile is uh, is ships with all major application servers right now, so I don't have you know to ask for permission whether I can use it or not. I just use it. And uh, so I have already, you know, Org Eclipse Micro Profile and Java X namespaces. So it's not as nice as it was before, for a reason. So and now uh, I just thought about that and and looked at the projects uh, I spent time with, and I think it is not as a big deal just to re rename everything at once. So even a large project. So if they, you know, there is always migration or small refactorings, and I think it the best thing would be just rename the whole Java X to uh, Jakarta. And then it is a clear cut. You say, okay, now we are starting over. And uh, this is even better, you know, what I think it is a way better for new developers because they are absolutely not interested in the history, how it was, or what Oracle or not. It's like, okay, forget Oracle. Now we have no Eclipse. Uh, this is open source. Everything starts with Jakarta and it's almost solved, except, of course, some minor issues that some like XA exception is in JDK, not in uh, in, in 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 Jakarta. But I would say ninety percent of the of the issues are solved. And what we should not underestimate is the marketing power, right? Because uh, uh, this uh, this consistent naming and branding, I think it is very very important for the success. 
Yes, there are, there are three things. Uh, the first is uh, the char card, the Java X namespace. Initially, we hoped, and it was kind of fueled with kind of um, that we could not add any new features to Java X, but at least change the classes in there mm -hmm. or add new classes to the existing packages. So it was clear from the beginning that we must not add new packages to mm -hmm. Java X. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of the common understanding is that we could still evolve the, let's say, server request or whatever, uh, and add new methods if needed. And this is now, even that is forbidden. You, you must not even deprecate something. Uh, so I think the only viable solution is really to do a complete rename. Mm -hmm to the char Carter X namespace. And technically, this is not that complicated. I've done it already in, in Apache. Mm -hmm. I have a branch of the uh, Geronimo specs. So at Apache, we, in the Geronimo projects, which the Geronimo application service is dead, but Geronimo is still a project which is kind of a, the common parts of Java E of Apache. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a specs project, and this contains all the specs IP clean, Apache licensed, uh, and I moved a lot of them already from Java X to Jakarta. Mm -hmm. They are all snapshot versions, which just compile it, then you're good. And then I already moved Apache Open Weapons, the CDI container, and I have Tomcat running with Jakarta. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the next step would have been Achillean and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the process of uh, Open GPA is also. It, it's not that much. It's a lot of manual work, but it's nothing complicated. Yeah, exactly. And and for the business, the, the thing is that an, a Java enterprise project consists of many layers. So you first have the, the bytecode assembly stuff, which had to change every uh, with the, the new versioning uh, scheme from the Java JDK. You have to change it every major version anyway. So pff, the, the servers have to move anyway right now. Uh, then you have some libraries like uh, loggers, logger frameworks, which have integration and um, JPA, JSF container, CDI container, all the libraries which are used internally in the containers. Then, of course, the application server like Wildfly, Tommy, um, and so on have to change. And then the business logic can change. And then a lot of, of uh, downstream projects, all libraries are also needed, like Apache Delta Spike will be forked uh, internally, a branch will be for Jakarta and so on. There are tons of projects and they have to move. But this is solvable. There's a lot of work, but it's not a complicated kind of work. It's just renaming those packages, compiling it through, and you're done. Um, and, and I would even argue it is healthy. Yeah, I know mean, every 20 years we can do su such a thing, I would say. Yeah, but we we must do it only once. I'm a big fan of the Big Bang migration because if you think you only move those parts, those specifications, if there is a change needed, then this migration from Java X to Jakarta would kind of make us busy for the next 10 years and then we will lose people. I think doing the Big Bang migration once is solvable. And the most important thing about those specifications is not the package name. Of course, binary compatible is nice, but it's the knowledge, how to deal with those, the, the mechanics, which are the, I, the basic building blocks and ideas behind all those specifications. And those don't change. It's just the package which changes, mm -hmm. but that's it. And in There's practice for projects, I would say it's even simpler because uh, if I remember, so the majority of my proje projects are using JAXRS, uh, a little bit bin validation, uh, a yeah. little bit of EJB, so minor part of EJBs, and a little bit of CDI. Uh, this is a very simple business projects, and of course JSON B and JSON P, mm -hmm. and uh, so so we don't have a lot, you know, JSF right now and stuff like that. And if we have, there's a different module, and. Uh, I just we, we only will have to know to basically rename the import. Yes, exactly. So and there, there's nothing else to do for business. So I mean, the whole discussion is just like from vendor perspective, is larger task. Yes. From the business perspective, is is I mean, it's trivial. So it's absolutely trivial. So I don't even know whether we should spend 
time thinking about that. So if the vendors like the the the, the idea of migrating to Jakarta E, it, it is actually a, a a huge deal for or, or a minor deal for 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 the businesses. Plus, um, it's also this would be needed needing a combination of um, class uh, re. Um, we transform Java agent plus class loader, uh, but it's perfectly doable for the application servers that you could even deploy old applications which use the JavaX package namespace because on class load, it would kind of dynamically replace all those bytecode which reference JavaX mm -hmm. for certain packages to Jakarta.x yes. for certain packages. Yeah. On the fly, yeah. the application internally would run in the JVM as Jakarta something, mm -hmm. but the chars would still consist uh, of Java X mm -hmm. class files. And from the branding perspective, you know, people are still talking J2E. Uh, last week in 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 a uh, in a workshop, actually, someone said, "Yeah, but the what you are showing is not uh, J2E." And it's like, w what are you talking about? And 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 then I, the, the um, attendee referred to, "Yeah, I was in a project with XML." I was like, "Yeah, but this is like 15 years ago." I mean. Yeah. This is actually no more true. Font 2006 was Java 6, uh, 13 years ago, and um, and with Jakarta we can say okay, there is no more Java. You know, forget it. This was past. Now everything is Jakarta. So this is a clean break. Mm -hmm. Also with the branding and the history. Somehow people cannot forget. You know the J2E times from 2003. Yeah, I see one bigish um, potential risk on the table, but it's completely not technical it's um, the eclipse foundation is very protective about all those things and in my opinion now with the java x to jakarta stuff mm -hmm. they need to be way more open also to other foundations like having that the, the apache software foundation is not having a seat on the table um on the, the jakarta board is is kind of stupid Let's say it that way, because most of the projects, even Glassfish, consists of sixty or seventy percent of of Apache projects. Glassfish is based on Tomcat, <laughs> so this is really, really weird. So we give more power to the Java user groups. Give more power to other foundations. But why you could do this? So just apply for the seat? No, 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 no. That's not possible. You have to be an what's it called, a strategic member or something like that. Yeah, you, either you have to pay or you have yes. to commit code. No, no, no. You have to pay. No, I, I had that no. podcast with Mike, and he uh, actually we have to re-listen that. And okay. and he From said if you are committer of a project, there is another way to become to have a seat. Uh, there is one seat for all the community. Oh, okay. That's not the same. Okay, this is the problem. This is one, seat. A, a, okay. one community representative, which Iva does, and Iva does it great. Um, but uh, it is one seat. That's that's not the 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 full story. The rest is paid vendors like IBM, Red Hat. So the IBM has kind of two seats on the table right now. <laughs> Oracle, Fujitsu, and and that's it. Um, okay. And one community representative. So what you should do, your, your university spin-off has to buy, you know, a seat and then you are the chief of Jakarta. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's not the way we do it. Yeah, I know it. I know it. It's just fun. Things which should be open. Hey, Mark, where people can find you? Do you have any references? So your blog, Twitter, company name, whatever you like. So how the um, listeners can find you on the internet? Um, I'm at Struberg at Twitter and Struberg at Apache.org and well. Mark Struberg as S-T-R-U-B-E-R-G. Exactly. Perfect. So uh, thank you. And what I really would like to do is in the next few weeks, invite you again and talk about microservices and then talk about something else what we left over. But the microservice was the first obvious topic. If you have time, we can repeat that. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me and enjoy the day. Thank you. <laughs> okay, ciao.